Following last week's exciting cliffhanger, whereby the Doctor literally was turned into a weeping angel, Survivors of the Flux picks up as the Doctor stops being a weeping angel. And by last week, I do mean the previous episode, episode 4, as well, last week was long after the airing of Survivors of the Flux because of um, this guy. The main plot of the episode, and perhaps the only plot of any use, follows the Doctor as she enters into the Vision's headquarters and meets Tech Teyu. And to those of you who were convinced she was going to be the Rani, Nafam. Basically, the Doctor and Tech Teyun argue, well, Tech Teyun info dumps, and basically we just find out all the Doctor's memories are inside a fob watch. We then get more info dumping, setting up for episode 6, as we find out Tech Teyun made the flux because of the Doctor, and there'll be a second flux for good measure, which will just wipe everything out for good as the Division moves to a different universe. But then, Swarm and Azure sail in and kill Tech Teyun. So that's an underwhelming A plot for nothing but exposition, but surely the rest of the episode has something of value, right? Well, this episode we not only get a B plot, but we're also fortunate enough to get a C plot. So surely we'll have a great deal of stuff which will further the plot along to show us how brilliantly Chris Chibnall can utilise this brand new six episode structure. Yaz, Dan and Jericho, for example, potter about while globe hopping in the early 20th century, finding out clues to when the second flux will happen, which just turns out to be six weeks after the first flux, but that's not it, because they're also attempted to be killed by an unknown force identified with the symbol of a snake, and they spend several months painting around the Great Wall of China. That's great, and all, but sadly it literally amounts to nothing. The Great Wall of China stuff is there for a cheap gag, which will be as funny is a cheap gag, and the trio being hunted down by people who appear to be servants of the Grand Serpent is literally never explained. At least not in these six episodes, but I don't know why you'd explain that later, it'd be a bit weird. What's worse is the whole crux of this plot relies on the Doctor telling Yaz in a pre-recorded hologram about the second flux event, which she doesn't find out about until Tech Taeyun tells her in episode 5, this episode. So god knows how, just before the end of Once Upon Time, the Doctor was able to record this message to Yaz. I guess adaptive hologram brings on an entirely new meaning. These scenes are held together by the strong performances from Mandip Gill, John Bishop and Kevin McNally, but sadly, there's very little value elsewhere apart from some cheap gags and slightly offbeat comic relief. It just screams a filler, and considering that it's not even till the next episode that Yaz actually discovers the date of the second flux, which I'll get onto a bit later, the whole subplot is rendered entirely pointless. You could cut this whole thing out and literally nothing would change. The only thing is getting Yaz, Dan and Jericho to the Williamson Tunnels at the end of the episode, but that happens so very close to the end, and because of all the time travelling hijinks going on inside them, it really didn't matter what time the trio entered the tunnels in, they could have been in 2021 or 1967 or whatever date you want to give them. This was a subplot which should, should have been good, and had the ability to be good, but because nothing of consequence or any importance actually happens within, and it's just a load of red herrings, it's pointless. Moving on to the C plot, and we get the scenes that I assume in 5 or 10 years time will be resoundingly what fans think of when Survivors of the Fox is brought up in a casual conversation. It's essentially just massive fan service with little purpose and is almost entirely filler, again, but it does show a little more of a purpose than the B plot. Essentially, we see the Grand Serpent showing up across the history of Unit and manipulating events so he can be in charge of Unit in 2021 to invite the Centaurans of all people to invade Earth. The scenes are good in themselves and the 1967 one is especially pleasing for fans with multiple nice little callbacks, including this brilliant one, obviously. <laughs> I like that. That's our new corporal. Brought him in after we missed the whole thing at the post office tower. He's a shouter, but he's very good. Keeps everyone on their toes. The aesthetics and design takes us right into the Pertwee era and works very well. Absolutely hats off to the production designer and the costume designer for their work on this scene. It feels absolutely authentic. 
What doesn't necessarily work is the scene in the 80s, which comes off as much more drawn out and padded with little nostalgia to hang it around, so it just doesn't really work. We already saw the Grand Serpent killing the head of unit in the 67 scene, so we don't really need to see this repeated again in literally the next scene. This next scene just shows the Grand Serpent eating dinner with the chairman of unit and then threatening to kill him before we get a whole other scene set at his house where the Grand Serpent actually kills him. Not only does this scene not even need to be there for us to understand what the Grand Serpent is up to because we already know that, but it unnecessarily extends into two scenes. For the sake of filling up the runtime, I assume, instead of just killing the man over dinner. If the point in the scenes was in fact just nostalgia, then surely in these 80s scenes they could have actually put nostalgia in it. You know, maybe include some blue capped unit soldiers or a reference to Battlefield or something instead. The scene just repeats information we already know and just drags on for far too long. Moving forward in time to 2017, we get the return of Kate Stewart. As the Grand Serpent fires her and then decides to wind down unit operations or what, and then Kate info dumps to the camera as she explains what the Grand Serpent's plan has been, despite seeing it being repeated twice beforehand, so we understand the plan. This just demonstrates how much these scenes are filler, as not only do we see it shown again and again, but we also get Kate to explain it to us, meaning we didn't even need to see it. Anyway, Kate goes home and is nearly blown up or something before going on the run. I'm sure we get a big finish box set about it eventually. Finally, there's a little bit with Ben and Vinder, where they miss each other as Carvinista brings her to Earth and Vinder gets transported into Passenger. It's, you know, it's about a minute scene. The episode, being frank, it's a mess. It's a shame because this episode really could have worked well, but instead it's three half-explored plots padded out to the max with loads of info dumps, nostalgia for nostalgia's sake, and tonally divisive comic relief wrapped up to be the important penultimate chapter of this mega length serial. It just doesn't work. The next episode proved even more so that this episode was complete filler, as the Doctor just ignores everything Tech Tehun says. She apparently already knew about the final flux event before Tech Tehun info dumps this according to Yaz's message. Yaz, Dan and Jericho find out the December 5th date in episode 6 and the Grand Serpent basically does nothing in the finale, so all this episode is basically useless, but I'll talk about that in a second. For now, survivors of the flux though, I give you a 4 out of 10. It has nice isolated moments for sure. But it's all completely pointless. Episode 6 now, following the hollowness of Survivors of the Flux, has the biggest task of all the episodes, and that's to wrap up everything in only an hour, essentially having to do what should have been a two hour job, time shared with episode 5. A lot happens in this episode, and yes, yes, it's messy. It's a real shame that the final two chapters of Flux ended like this because episodes 1, 2 and 4 were fantastic and then sadly Chim will just seem to drop the ball. We get several different plots here but they are all intercut and feature their own unique Vertip Doctor who splits her consciousness throughout. Just, just, just go with it. it. It makes no sense but just go with it. The main 13th Doctor, as I'll consider her, continues at Division HQ and is confronted by Swarm and Ashore, who begin to destroy and undestroy her memories and something as they info dump to her. The next 13th Doctor is reunited with Yaz, Dan, Jericho and Kate in the Williamson Tunnels, now on December 5th, 2021, as Yaz saw the date at the beginning of the episode in front of a door that they're looking for and then it's never mentioned as really being important again. Thanks episode 5, you've been less useful now. Kate's leading Earth's resistance against the Sontaran occupation, despite the Sontarans only having been on Earth, at least in this invasion, for what seems to be a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm sure that's right. Anyway, this leads them to a corner shop when they find a Sontaran with an eating disorder, which the Doctor very cruelly and very out of character on this ass, exploits. Great show Doctor, that's an example to set. They then get Jericho and Claire on board the St. Thomas ship to confirm that today is in fact the final day of the Final Flux event, which we already knew, and honestly I can't work out why the Doctor does this, but let's just go with it. It puts them in danger and gets Jericho killed, but okay, right. The next 13th Doctor is on Bell's ship with Carvanista as they crash it into a St. Thomas ship, which coincidentally has the Grand Serpent aboard. The Doctor and Carvanista are captured and have a confrontation in their cell, where the Doctor finds out that Carvanista was the fugitive Doctor's companion. This scene is actually really good, and almost definitely is the best scene in the whole episode. So that's something. 
Anyway, the chief's in town and tells Carbonista that all the Lupari are dead and he howls. The doctor is interrogated by the Grand Serpent before the doctor from subplot 2 comes to rescue her and then we get two Jodie Whittakers together. Which I can just tell you, literally from anecdotal evidence at least, completely confused the casual audience and made the episode already messily structured even harder to follow than before. The last thing anyone wants at the end of a six part epic is the most confusing end to it as possible. You want a very simple but high stakes ending just to wrap everything up, not this. Anyway, hijinks ensues and after rescuing Vinda and Diane, Diane comes up with the idea to trap the second flux into a passenger form. They also use the Lupari shields to kill all the Suntarans, Cybermen and Daleks, but this is such a messy episode you'd be forgiven for forgetting that even happened. Anyway, Passenger absorbs the flux and the Doctor finds herself outside the Temple of Atribos with Swarm and Ashore. Time is annoyed that they didn't succeed and kills them. And then we get a fourth, fourth Jodie Whittaker in this episode, this time being the manufacture of Time itself, essentially fulfilling the role of the Ood from Planet of the Ood and Claudette Hubbard from Planet of the Dead. Then back in the TARDIS, the Doctor decides to dump the fog watch inside the TARDIS for no reason that's ever actually explained. It's not even hinted that she's learnt something in a character progression to make her decide not to open it. She just suddenly, without any character-defined reason, decides, not today, because we've got, you know, three episodes left before RTD comes back, so, you know, we can milk this a bit. And then, Flux ends. So, yeah, um, not, not great. Flux has a brilliant episode one, two, and four. A decent episode three, even. And then we get this pointless episode 5 and completely nonsensical episode 6. I haven't even mentioned the Grand Serpent's end yet and I'm not going to because there's literally nothing to say. Working off the groundwork from the first 4 episodes there's so much that could have been done here. But as I ended up saying throughout the whole of the Moffat era sadly, once again it's just wasted potential. I can only hope this is rectified in the special, some of it at least. But maybe it may just be better if they just move on and just leave all this here, all this baggage and just do something fun for the last three specials, but I doubt that's going to happen. The Vanquishers were well, better than episode 5. Sid isn't great, and to be honest, I'm just, I can't, I'm just going to give it a 5 out of 10. Oh dear! Oh dear, oh dear! Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear! What's wrong, Paul? It's the van insurance, Barry. It's gone through the roof. Don't worry, Paul. Go on, Barry. We can't sit around here all day. From vancompare.com.